Let's talk Gillette. Scams have increasingly become a problem for Gillette residents. So we sat down to get some scam avoidance tips from two of the City of Gillette's experts on crime and computers. They had a lot of good tips and information about the kind of scams that you should be on the lookout for. First, City of Gillette Police Detective Forrest Rothlutner will talk about the approach to scams from the law enforcement perspective. I'm Forrest Rothlutner, I'm a detective with the City of Gillette. Common Scams some of the most common scams that we're seeing recently involve individuals either entering relationships via long distance email, text message, things like that, and then being requested to send funds, whether through gift cards or Bitcoin or, or direct deposit. We're seeing multiple different ways people are asking to be paid, but generally these start with Sometimes they can say it's a romance, sometimes it's just someone engaging in some sort of a day trading type behavior as well. But generally we're seeing scams built primarily on long distance relationships. And we've had multiple different ones. Generally when we see a Bitcoin scam, it's more targeted towards people who are looking to invest. It's presented as an investment opportunity from somebody that either they found on social media or reached out to them on social media or with the Bitcoin scams. It can also just be a straight theft by deception. So whether that's an employer, somebody reaching out through a large corporation, we've had this happen with large corporations where people are given instructions for certain types of payments to pay licenses. And they say, oh, we're behind the eight ball, we need some help, can you go over and send me this money via this unorthodox means, whether that's Bitcoin or gift cards or a number of different methods for payment. But individuals, they're so caught up in that large organization that it seems viable because they don't know everybody they interact with on a regular basis, and so they end up sending those payments. What to do if you are a victim of a scam? If someone finds themselves victim of a scam, the number one thing that we say, the triage method, would be to first make sure that whatever bank account, whatever payment method that you have used to transmit this payment is secure, whether that's a debit card, a bank account. If you still have the gift cards that were asked to be received, secure those things. Don't send any more information on those things. Contact the banks and let them know that you've been alerted to a scam. A lot of times there's some shame involved in these types of scams where people are afraid to come forward because they feel like that someone got the better of them. In those situations, you just have to know that these people are professionals. They do this all day long. They sit in a room and, and this is their actual job is to take money from people by deception. And so while it is embarrassing to have been gotten the better of, the best thing you can do moving forward is to actually tell someone so that they can help you through these things, whether that's a banker or a police officer or even through the FBI's portal. One of the best things you can do is come to the police department because we do deal with this type of behavior on a regular basis. And so we know the most common scams. We know when there are certain types of scams that we can actually go back after certain funds. But we need to know those things very, very quickly because the longer these things wait, the more these transactions are solidified. So whether it's through Bitcoin, if a Bitcoin scam is caught early, it's a lot easier to trace and see where that actually went to. If it's a bank account, a lot of times we're able to use either through the FBI's resources or through the bank themselves. We can sometimes transmit hold harmless agreements depending on how the funds were taken, but it all has to be done in a very timely manner. Law enforcement and scams. Generally, when we get these things, we're, we're looking for ways to find a human that is within our ability to prosecute. So if we are looking at, we're looking for a scam that's through a bank transfer, we're going to look at the person who received those funds immediately. If it's an onshore bank account transfer, we will write search warrants and see who received those funds. We will ask for the count balances when we receive those funds. And then we'll actually go directly to that individual through either law enforcement in the local area, or we'll write an affidavit for an arrest warrant for these individuals who have received these funds. We look at these on a case-by-case -case basis. So sometimes these individuals are brought into the organizations that are taking this money by being a victim themselves at some point. So we look at these on a case-by-case -case basis, and sometimes we will look at a prosecution on someone who's been involved, and sometimes we won't, uh, just depending on how aware they are of, of themselves being a cog in the wheel of this larger organization. Sometimes the individuals who have received the funds through like a bank transfer, they will be contacted ahead of time and said, hey, you've won this money. We need you to transmit this to so-and-so and you can keep a portion of this. So they may not know these are stolen funds. And so what we look at those individuals, if they're aware, if they've had this happen to them, or they are aware that this particular type of theft has occurred to them and they know that they're passing on 
likely stolen funds from somebody else. We're far more likely to pursue a prosecution on someone who's aware of that than someone who still believes that they're sending money for their boyfriend who's overseas and he can't give this money, but his aunt can send this money to him. So there's many different methods of that deception, but we look for the individual nuances of each of these cases so that we know whether or not that's a prosecution that we want to move forward with. Scam identification and avoidance. I think more recently, the methods that we were using before to try to help individuals keep from being victim to scams are kind of dated. We look at these things as these only happen to people who are older, people who are less savvy with technology. But very recently in the last year, we've seen an uptick of individuals who should be very well tech savvy. They're in their 20s, 30s, 40s. Individuals who are aware of bank accounts, who are you know involved in investing. They should be able to see the signs and warnings of these cases. The biggest thing to remember is that if something seems too good to be true, it is. There's no such thing as a free lunch. These are all the old tropes that our grandparents told us years ago are all true. And if someone offers you some hundreds of thousands of dollars just to do this little task and it's gonna cost you money, remember that likely these are one-way streets. Any amount of money that you send out will not be returned and these things don't go backwards. And so if something looks too good to be true, it is. That's, that's what it comes down to. Resources for victims of scams. Some of the better resources that someone can reach out to on the local level would be to start with their bank. Start with the individuals that they know that they can walk through the teller line and greet on a daily basis. They're gonna get you on the right track on how to protect yourself in a situation where you've been compromised. The next step I would say would be contact law enforcement, whether it's the sheriff's office or us, the police department. Contact us and don't be afraid, even if it seems petty, we, we look at these cases on a regular basis and we're also looking for trends. It's not necessarily that we're gonna be able to do everything with every case, but if we can see a trend that's happening that is common, we can use a public service announcement in order to help combat that to maybe save another victim. Or we also use tools like the IC3 complaint department at the FBI. There's an online IC3 complaints that you can file a complaint on your own behalf. We can file a complaint for you in that same system. And there are people that are looking at that each and every day, all day long, looking for specific types of transactions where they can affect a resolution right away. In those cases where whether there's an active bank transfer still going on, sometimes those bank transfers are able to be stopped just by putting those credentials in at the correct time. So that's another great federal resource, but make sure you report it locally as well, because if that companion complaint has a local person looking at it, you're likely to get someone on the other end of the phone who can really help you through that process as well. Identity protection services. ID theft and monitoring protection can be very useful. It will give you an early warning if something is happening. A lot of times they'll be able to shut things down quicker than if you were just going on your own. Those are great services. I can't necessarily recommend one over the other just because there are so many out there. But do your research and if you find one that you think is going to fit your specific type of needs, what kind of accounts you have, what type of purchasing you do on the internet, those things, if you find one that's gonna fit well, I think it could be a good investment depending on the situation. Social media scams. One of the things that we're seeing more often now are individuals posing as a local individual, maybe even using a local structure or something that makes you think that they're from the town or the region that you're in inside of the classified ads attached to social media. And these individuals will sometimes, they will be selling something, sometimes they'll be renting. We've had a number of individuals who paid first and last month's rent on properties, and it turns out that that property wasn't for rent, and sometimes people even showed up to start moving in and found out that this was a house that was owned by somebody else. And these cases are, are becoming more and more prevalent, and they can be a national scam, they can be a local scam. It's kind of dependent. We've had some individuals in Casper that are in the same type of field as I am that have indicated that they found many of those to be local individuals selling their neighbors' properties. So be wary when you talk to these people. When you're looking for a rental property or looking to purchase something, make sure when you're speaking with that person, they actually are knowledgeable about the property. They actually can tell you things about the property. And then check with the local agency. So if you're going to move your utilities. Call up the city of Gillette when they're going to move your utilities and verify that you can. They're going to have to reach out to the original contact in the first place and verify those things as well. And that's all something that you're going to have to do if you're going to move in anyway, so it can be a good way to check to see if this is real or not. Another way to be sure that you're dealing with a real seller would be to take and do a simple reverse image search on any sort of post that you're trying to purchase a property on. 
purchase property or purchase items. If it's something where you're having any sort of question, a simple drag and drop into the Google image search reverse image will show you if that's ever been posted at any other location. So if this is posting on Zillow and it looks like that person took that photo from Zillow to make a post saying that it was for rent, that's a very common thing. But if you just simply drag that image and look again, it'll show you any time that image has been used on the internet, which can be a very good indication on whether or not this is a legitimate post or not. City of Gillette IT manager Mike Porter addressed how to protect yourself online and on social media. So I'm Mike Porter. I'm the IT manager here at the City of Gillette. Getting hacked. Causes and concerns. Well, the biggest reason, normally it's always an email address and then a password combination for most of the sites that you'll get into. So if one site gets compromised, so let's say your email account or your Facebook account gets compromised, that person now has that combination of that email and password that then they can just try random things, just try a different bank account, try Amazon accounts. So they, they'll start trying various things. Also, these email addresses and password combinations get sold on the dark web. There's actually a business for this where people will sell just these random combinations of user ID and passwords, and then people can try them and use them wherever they want to and see what they can get into. Unfortunately, too, now with uh, computer processing power, it isn't necessarily a person sitting at a keyboard trying these combinations. They could put this into a computer and just have it just try a random list of login sites and see which one it actually works on. So that's why it's very important not to repeat that same and use that same password over and over again. Secure passwords. Creating a password, I like to use phrases or song lyrics, and then throwing symbols in, you know, zeros for an O or, you know, those kind of things. Remember, you can use a space. Most applications will let you use a space as a character, which will help create those passwords. But those are for the ones that you have to remember that you, to type at the keyboard. I normally would recommend people would use a password application of some kind, uh, Keeper Security, 1Password, Dashlane. There's tons of them out there. I mean, they're not usually that much money. In fact, you can purchase like a family plan and share it with your entire family. But these are password managers that will then also generate random passwords that you'll never have to enter again. They'll be just crazy, you know, 10, 20, 30 character long passwords of just gibberish that'll be unique to that site. But you'll never have to remember that because you use your password, the one that you know, we were talking about creating with a phrase or whatever, to get into that password software, which will then populate your websites. Many of these have iPhone, Android apps available, as well as browser plugins that you can use. So you really just have to remember the one password, which is kind of nice. Any large organization, any large IT organization, we have just hundreds of passwords, so we have to use these, but I recommend them personally as well because everybody is getting a ton of passwords these days. You should always know your password because at some point, if something happens, like fingerprints, for instance, if you, you're doing your fingerprint scan in your iPhone all the time, well, then you scratch your, you're doing woodworking or something, you scratch your finger, you know, you can't get into your, your iPhone, you can't get into anything. Always have a backup for that password, for sure. I also recommend, especially with really sensitive things, you should have some kind of multi-factor or two-factor enabled on, on pretty much everything that's important. So if you are using password software, for sure, put a multi-factor authentication on there. It could be an SMS push, which is a text message that comes to your phone. In some cases, you can use a, like a Google Authenticator or an Authy Authenticator to create these codes that you can put in as a second way to get in. They're helpful in case your account does get compromised, somebody does get that password for some reason. They still can't access it without that second piece. Identifying suspicious emails. Well, first of all, just because the email says it's coming from a, a recognized contact doesn't mean that's actually who's sending that email. It's pretty easy to change the name on anybody's email account and send an email that looks like them. Most email applications have a way to kind of expand in that header of your email. There's usually a little drop down carrot or some way to expand that. And you can see not only the name, but you'll see the actual email address. So you can verify what that is. Now, the other piece of that, you could have a reply to address in there that might be completely wrong. That could be a sign that that other person's email is compromised. So things like that. Probably the bigger issue is if you're being asked to do something that's just seems ridiculous. You're getting asked to send like iTunes gift cards to somebody in a professional manner that normally nobody would want these iTunes gift cards. Doesn't make sense. Uh, pick up the phone and call them. You know, talk to them in person and say, hey, did you really want me to do this? Be sure to use the contact information you know for that person. Don't just rely on the information in the email because if that person's email is compromised, they're going to probably put fake numbers in there to take the call and try to trick you some more. Malware. 
So malware is basically, it's, it's just software, but it's software that's intentionally put on a machine and it usually has two purposes. One is to break the device, cause some kind of harm, could be to extort some money from you. So ransomware, for instance, will encrypt your hard drive and make you pay Bitcoin to get it unencrypted. And in some cases, malware can just be an application you're using that has a piece that's kind of siphoning off personal information. So you install this app on your Android phone, iPhone, and you're just playing a little game with it, but on the back of it, it's actually doing like a key logger where it's capturing your passwords for your bank accounts. So it's, it's basically software that's put there on purpose to break or steal information from you. Becoming infected by malware. Putting software on your machine pretty much from untrusted sources. Now, if you tend to go through like the Google Play Store, the App Store from Apple, you're more guaranteed to have a safer application installed. Same thing with just downloading stuff from a website. If you're wanting to uh, download Adobe PDF or uh, Acrobat Reader, for instance, go to adobe.com, verify that that is where you're going and don't try to get some free stuff from somewhere. I think most malicious software in that manner is downloaded and put on somebody's machine because you're trying to get something for free. So it might look like it's free and they put all these different things on your machine trying to act like you're getting this free software, which you're not. The main reason it's free is they're putting malicious software on your computer. If your device has been compromised. Well, the biggest thing is to stop using that device. Don't use it for anything sensitive. If you were going to remediate like a computer, for instance, or a phone, I would, I would wipe the device and start over. Um, it's usually not worth the risk of just trying to clean up that piece. I would then change all your passwords. That Anything that you accessed on that device, I would make sure to change that password, just to be on the safe side. If your accounts have been compromised, it's kind of different for each item because people can do different things with those tools or with those applications. So if it's a bank account, for sure, you want to change that password. You want to inform your financial institution so they can help you lock that down. In some cases, it might be getting a new debit card, a new checking account number, things like that. Of course, be watching your financial statements to make sure that there's no strange transactions going on and you can alert your bank right away. But if it's email, Changing password again, great place to start. But you also have to look at the rules that somebody might have set up on your account without you looking at it. And what I mean by these rules are they could put in certain email filters that will take emails from certain people and forward them to other people. They could be granting other people access to your account. The same thing can happen with a Facebook or some other, you know, like cellular plan accounts or things. So you basically have to change the password and look through all your security settings and make sure that there's no other delegated access or rules that somebody created when they had access to your account. And it can be very time consuming depending on how much and what they had. So again, it's nice to know if you had multiple passwords for everything and somebody got into just your Amazon account, you know, okay, this is what I got to look at. This is the password that got out. But if you use that same password combination for your bank and for your email, you got to go through each one of those, change that password and look at all those settings just to be sure. For more information on scams and scam avoidance, I've linked to the FBI scams and safety page in the description. Or you can contact the City of Gillette Police Department either by calling the Detective Division at 307-682-5155 or by visiting the Police Department in person at City Hall. Let's Talk Gillette is a production of Gillette Public Access Television and the City of Gillette. For more information on city operations, visit the city's website, gillettewy.gov, or follow the City of Gillette on Facebook or Instagram.